Hey everyone, welcome to uh, the Business of Good Live. I'm Jason Haber. Thanks for joining us today on, an, on our new uh, another segment. A really amazing topic today. We're going to be talking about one of the things that's central in the business of good is this idea of capitalism 2.0. The idea that you can revise and find different ways to make a difference in your community or in the world and using capitalism as a fulcrum for that change. You know, when we talk about capitalism in the 20th century, this is a question that I put in the book and I'll ask you right now, we'll see who out there is watching us who knows this. The stock market crashes in 1929. In what year did it recover? The answer may surprise you. The answer is 1954. It took 25 years for the stock market to recover. And throughout the 20th century, there are these rises and falls in the economy that occurred most recently, of course, in the 21st century, the Great Recession. And what we've learned from all of these things is that there are ways that the private sector can be involved to make really profound change. And one of the ways they can do that is through social enterprise. And joining me today is, um, is an amazing person, Britt Gilmore, who's the president of The Giving Keys, is with us. We're going to talk about the work that they do. And I think it's so important because a lot of what The Giving Keys does relates to helping abate the homelessness crisis in this country. You know, I'm live in New York City, and, and Britt's out in California. In New York City, there are 60,000 people who are homeless. That's roughly 20% of the entire population of Orlando, Florida. And the solutions that have come forward so far in the private sector have been really limited. From Mostly they come from government and nonprofits, and while all noble and good, there are new ways to think about how to fuel job growth, and to get homeless people to transition uh, out of that environment. And so we're going to talk a little about that today uh, with Britt. Britt, are you there? Yes. All right. Thanks for coming on today. First of all, congratulations. So Britt was named on Forbes list of 30 under 30. Um, amazing way to go. Uh, how, did you, how, did you, uh, how did you feel when you found out that was coming? Man, it was just such a cool way to start the year. This was the second time that uh, this I was in the process of, of, of being nominated, so the first year didn't get it, second year got it. So it just felt, honestly, for me, it felt like a team win. Yeah. Um, I've obviously personally invested a lot of my time and energy into what the Giving Keys um, is today, but there are 75 amazing people that work with us right now that contributed to us getting to where we are. So when when I like walked into the office and they were celebrating the moment, I was really reflecting it back on them to say this is this is a win for all of us. So, and I, I truly feel that. Very cool. Now, the first place I, I wanted to go here is so on the if you go to the Giving Keys website, the first thing you see on the site when you look at the company you're reading about the company, it says um, under our impact, it says we're not a nonprofit, we're a social enterprise. A really big distinction to make. What? T just tell me about that distinction and why that's so important to the to the core of the company. I mean, we really believe that social enterprise is a, a really important model for uh, changing communities. I love the fact that we aren't having to live off of do donations to run our organization. We get to sell a product that we really believe in and at the same time create jobs for people that are transitioning out of homelessness. So no, it's just this very sustainable model. And some of my friends that run nonprofits, I know the rigors of fundraising and right. what they constantly have to on a treadmill. Yeah. Run their, their organizations, and I think that this is just a really great way to alleviate the the fundraising element, so that you can focus on the development of of the organization itself. Do you ever get blowback? Did people ever say? And this is a, a problem, I think, in in social enterprise in general. It's like, and someone mentioned this in my book. If you created an app and that app gave you fuzzy eyebrows and you made a billion dollars off of it, people would say, hey, you know, great way to go. But like at the same token, if you do something that has some sort of social good and it's a, it has a profit behind it, then there's something wrong with that. You ever get that meant, uh, thrown back at you? Honestly, in our case, I have never experienced a back on that. Um, I think that people start to question how much money you're spending on uh, salaries and other areas of the business and like what the dollar allocation is to the actual mission. Right. Um, but I think that transparency and 
um, just exposing what your model truly is is the most helpful way to kind of mitigate the blowback that you might get. Right. And do you, you know, when you get um, you, people coming to, to the website, do you find that people are, are interested in the product because, A, it's really well designed, it's really cool, it, it's got a, a great branding behind it, but there's, that, there's the other piece to it, too. And this social component to it, how central is it to the, to the core of the company and to what you guys do day in, day out? It's absolutely core. I think internally we always talk about the fact that we've got kind of like these two pillars um, at the heart of what the Gibby Keys does. And one is this whole concept of uh, giving your key away, wearing a word that you need, embracing the message that's stamped onto that key, and then at some point giving it, give it to somebody that needs that word more than you. And then built into our model, we're also creating jobs for people transitioning out of homelessness. And we really put both of those things under the banner of being a pay it forward company. And to kind of define pay it forward in the way that we talk about it at uh, the Gaming Keys is that we believe paying it forward is using what you have to give to another and encouraging them to continue to pay that forward and give it on to someone else. So we're using our business as a way to give back to our community and our product is meant to be worn and given away um, as a way to pay it forward to people that our customers encounter and create those really important connective moments um, that we all really need and want as humans. So in speaking of the pay it forward model, so it's something we wanted to actually show in action today. So we act, we have two uh, giving keys on, on us right now here. So um, this one here says peace on it. And we have another one here that says fearless on it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give these two away along with the copies of, of my book, The Business of Good, to our users out there who, um, who can tell us why they could use peace or fearlessness in their life right now. So if you just write us on Facebook and, um, and Jeffrey over here to my left is going to be reading them and he'll, he'll let you know who, who we'll be giving those out to. Um, so we are going to pay it forward with these great, these great products here. But let, while I have the product in hand, Rick, can you just tell us a little about the, how they get manufactured and the story behind that? Because I think it's really interesting and important to the brand of the company. Yeah, so our founder, Caitlin Crosby, she's right here on the wall behind me, um, she was creating these keys and selling them at her merch table. Um, she's a musician and an actress. And that was kind of like the early days of how the company got started, was she was selling these keys on her tour. Yeah. Um, at a certain point, she was in Hollywood. She was at a film screening, walked out of the film screening, and saw this young homeless couple named Rob and Sarah that were sitting on the sidewalk holding a sign that said, a we need broke and pub. In true Caitlin fashion, she's like one of the most compassionate people I've ever met in my whole life. She she took them to dinner just because she wanted to hear their story. Um, so she like canceled her acting class, canceled her plans, and then took them out. So over the course of that dinner, she complimented Sarah's necklace, and Sarah's response was, thanks, I actually made this. I make jewelry. And it was this light bulb moment for Caitlin where she realized, oh my gosh, I'm making these giving keys, I'm selling them on my shows, I'm having a locksmith engrave them and stamp them for me, but I should bring you in to do this. I'm in a dumpster right now. Why don't I give you an opportunity that could get you out of that situation? So literally the next day, they started making giving keys, and it's been a part of our model ever since. Um, it's evolved a little bit. We now work with a partner called Chrysalis to employ us. They help us find the people that work on our production team that are all in the process of transitioning out of homelessness. So at our HQ, which I'm at, our HQ right now, this is our alleyway. Um, I'm sitting in our little uh, mobile shop in the alleyway, but inside the building right now, what you would find um, is a really diverse team of people where we do our manufacturing operation and all of our administrative operations out of the same space. We feel like it's really important for people that are in sales and marketing to be super connected to what our mission is um, and be able to be on the same team in the same space as all the people that are going through that process of transitioning out of homelessness. So we... Uh, the, the jobs that we're providing on the production team are um, assembly jobs, fulfillment jobs, logistics positions. Um, we've been able to promote people that were working in the assembly team to right. being coordinators. So they're now 
like they've been with us for two years and they've graduated into these kind of managerial roles. Um, but it's just really cool. If you're ever in LA, come, come down to our HQ. We love to be able to course. So, and, but let's go over that a, a little bit further because the people who are working there are transitioning out of homelessness. Yeah. How, and how do you, so how do you recruit those people and are there, you know, are there special needs? Are there, are there, are there concerns? I mean, how does that work internally? And at the same time, you're able to churn out a really high quality product. Like just tell us a little about that. So, like I mentioned, we have a partner called Chris Lips, and they are essentially a workforce development agency for low income and homeless individuals um, in LA. And their office is really close to our office. We got connected to them back in April of 2013. So, they do a job readiness training program. They have like a drop in center. So, people that qualify as homeless or low income are that's their client pool. So we will notify them when we have a job opening and they will send us candidates for interviews. And we do a two-week trial period where we're kind of evaluating the person's readiness to come to work. And then at that point, we offer them a, a job in kind of like a trial period for three to six months. And we're just looking for someone who's like motivated, really wanting to turn their life around, able to work on a team, uh, show up on time, do the, the responsibilities of the role, um, and just demonstrate that they really want to be with us and are ready to make uh, some changes in their life. So over that like three to six month period, we're evaluating who's going to be coming onto our team as like a permanent giving keys full-time production associate. And that's always the coolest moment because we get to do the celebration called the bell ringing where we go down to Chrysalis, we take our entire staff, the entire Chrysalis staff is there, and we uh, celebrate the graduation. So from from the moment they come onto our team, there's just this like really special uh, day where they're ringing the bell, they're giving a speech about ringing to other Chrysalis clients and encouraging them to stick with their program, and then uh, we come back to our HQ and they deliver a speech to our team and we get to in turn affirm them and celebrate them. And it just creates this like deep sense of community and, and stability for them. See, these are the kinds of success stories that you get in a social enterprise you can't get anywhere else. The, the way you can merge both creating and building a successful company, but also changing the lives not only of your, of your customers, but of the people that work there and help you make your product. Um, I think it makes sure it's just, I mean, as you know, when you're the president of the company, how rewarding it can be. Um, it, it, it is good for business, but you're also, you're, you're changing people's lives um, in really profound ways. And without this work, I mean, where would they be? Um, it's, it's scary to think about, but uh, I mean, that's the reality. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite experiences is a daily experience. I sit in my office and we don't have like full walls, so I get all the uh, shop room activity where they're actually hand stamping the keys. And one of our guys that stamps keys, he sings seal songs all the time. <laughs> and it's just like I love being in the same space and like realizing um, that like how connected all of us are and that we get to be so integrated and sharing in our journeys together. And um, it's just, it's a really, really unique environment. Very cool. By the way, we're going to take some questions from, from our, our Facebook uh, viewers right now. If we have any, uh, quite, we have one just came in. Um, how much do, oh, so how does it work in terms of compensation? Are they paid uh, on an hourly basis or are they, are they full-time employees? And how does, how does that work? Someone, we just got that question in. It's a good one. Sure. Yeah, they're all paid hourly. Uh, we are committed to paying living wage, where, where these jobs in another environment might be paid minimum wage. Right. Be based off of the living wage in the state of California. So we're doing the best that we can to make sure that people have enough income to get the roof over their head, get into a stable scenario. But yes, it is an hourly uh, position on the production team. And, and but let's talk about the business for a second because. In the last four years, you've gone from like three employees to, is it 60? Uh, 75. 75. See, I'm even behind already. So, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> amazing growth. I mean, 
Um, let's just talk yeah. about what it's been like over the last four years. Oh, yeah, when I started, there was there were three of us. We were in about 40 to 60 stores. Um, Caitlin had just gotten featured on Huffington Post earlier that year, this is in 2012, and that was like really one of the big kind of kickoff moments for yeah. the brand. So over the course of these four years, we built a relationship with Nordstrom. We had a, a few other major accounts come through that really lifted us um, and got us more exposure. So now we're in about 1,400 stores globally. We're, we're shipping from our .com globally. Um, and then obviously the, the team size has, has grown substantially. And then also revenue has been doubled year over year. Um, obviously, as we get bigger, doubling becomes harder to do. But it's been, it's been a really fast and wild ride and, so far. And QVC too recently, right? Yes. I was on QVC. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? So Caitlin, Caitlin, uh, she, she's usually the one that goes out and does speaking engagements and, and interviews and things like that. It's really, um, she, I mean, it's her baby and she's been such, such a huge inspiration to our team, but she just had a baby in September. So I took on the QVC thing for her and that was just like such a crazy and interesting experience. <laughs> um, just selling on TV and like, right. you know, we probably all have watched Joy. Um, it's It was just, yeah, a really unique moment. I was like, never in my life did I think I was going to be on QVC. But it went really well and they brought us back for a second show and we're, we're talking about some future opportunities with them already. So it's a, it's a good so, partner for us. Absolutely. And when you're on either... In, in any environment, it's QVC or the retailers, what kind of feedback do you get about the sort of the ethos behind the brand? Is that is that always front and center in the marketing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. Like I said earlier, we kind of have these two different pillars. So there's this idea, everything's under the banner of paying it forward, but we've got this model of uh, like the missional hiring people, employment, transitioning out of homelessness, and we've got the other side where our products are these inspirational keys that you're supposed to wear and, and give away. So sometimes it's hard to tell all of that in, in one moment. So depending on the, the partner or the venue, we might focus on one or the other a little bit more heavily. Um, but yeah, sometimes it can be it can be a lot of storytelling. But that's at the heart of what we do is keys are an amazing symbol of um, unlocking things. And it's a cool piece of jewelry. I think people enjoy wearing it, but I think there's just so much more meaning, meaning behind the product. Right. And you know who's making it um, and then what you're supposed to actually do with it as, as a wearer. See, so I, I we, would argue, we have to get this telling piece. And part of the things that I would argue is, that, you know, it, it, fashion's obviously a crowded space, but you're able to distinguish the brand in such an interesting way. And, you know, consumers get it. I mean, consumers are now more and more looking at companies and products that are aligned with their values and so when making purchasing decisions what we're seeing more and more particularly among millennials is that they're looking for companies that are really in sync with the way they think and the way they see the world and because millennials are so interested in in social change i'm, I'm not surprised that they they would gravitate towards you know this kind of making a, a purchase decision of buying a, a giving key versus or something else i think and this is something we talk about in the book it, if you if you do it right, it does give you to a degree uh, some sort of strategic advantage. You still have to have a quality product. You get no breaks by being in social enterprise. Um, you still have to have a quality product, and everything else has to be there as well. But if you're doing something that has this social ethos behind it, what what we've been finding is that it's going to resonate much more with people. And like you said, it's not it's it's a great piece of jewelry. You, you wear it, you like it, but at the same time, there is that deeper meaning to it. And and I think that really changes the the equation. I think that's the lesson for other social entrepreneurs. What do you think? Yeah, I would totally agree. I think that you really do have to lead um, with products first, but then the story is what fills in uh, like the, the additional motivators to purchase. So. For us, we would never want to lean so heavily on our story, and the product doesn't give—it doesn't satisfy the customer. Right. So that's that's critical, absolutely.
Absolutely. And as part of your, your retail expansion, you, you've, you've got this 1973 Airstream on display at the Grove and Americana. Those are, if, if you're in LA, you know what those are. Um, yeah. how, how's that gone? And are you going to bring it out to New York? We, we could use that here. We would love to. That would be Come so on. fun. It's freezing um, out now. Not now, but maybe you know, yeah, summer. Maybe in the summer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we got this Airstream uh, last summer. And we're in the process of renovating it, and we made contact with The Grove, which is like one of the biggest shopping centers in LA. So they invited us to come out for a weekend, and we got to debut this mobile shop that you can see behind me. Yeah. Um, it's been really fun to get out and get exposure to new audiences. Um, at The Grove, it's like, I think I heard a statistic that it's like the second most trafficked uh, shopping center in the country. So don't mark my words on that, but I, the, the number of tours that come through there, we just got to get a lot of people that had never heard of it. Like one of the unique features about this Airstream is that we decided to cover it, like paint the outside in black chalkboard paint. Yeah. And we actually invite people to come and write their paint board stories on the outside of the trailer. So like over the course of the weekend, it got kind of covered in all of these amazing stories of um, a woman, this one was like, like, I might even cry telling it. She wrote a story about how um, her husband gave her a giving key that said live on it, and he was actually in the Marines and got deployed in Iraq and uh, passed wow. on that um, deployment. And so it was like this really significant symbol of what her life should look like after he had been, um, after his life had been taken. So it was. Just hearing those kinds of stories from people and um, getting to have the conversations and, and learn how these keys are affecting them is, is really powerful. And that happens a lot more easily out on the street in the in the moment of uh, interacting with people in, in like a shopping center type scenario. So for now, the, the Airstream is staying at our headquarters until we kind of schedule some additional um, activations and, and events outside but we yeah we're excited to take it all on the road well that's well. that's a very powerful story and yes i think we'd love to see you in new york here so um i'm sure it'd be well received here for for sure so um very cool uh, it, amazing stuff i know we're just about out of time but um i mean let me ask you this where do you, you know do you, where people who are interested in getting into social entrepreneurship what's the biggest yeah. piece of advice you could give to them about you know how to start and how to think about a business that has a model like yours. Yeah, it's a great question. Well, whenever I get asked this question, I always lead with something our founder Caitlin says in her TED talk that it really should be something that you care about first. I think that because this is a a, a trend in business and people are seeing how cause marketing is it's motivated buyers. There needs to be, be like an authentic care for the, the issue that you're trying to solve. So being open to the needs around you, um, seeing and identifying what those are, but then actually from a place of true compassion and true care, uh, coming up and dreaming up with an idea. So I, I love that about Caitlin. Um, I love that that's something that she's encouraged other people to do, and that's an encouragement that I am totally on board with. Um, so I would just encourage you to find the, the need that you're really motivated to um, to meet and the people that you want to serve the most. And then um, I think for us in this process, we have a young team, so we've really invited a lot of mentors and advisors into our process. And I think for anybody out there that is like, this might be their first venture, or they they want to try something, but they don't have a formal background, just Look for people around you to mentor you and advise you through the journey so that you can kind of learn from them and not have to make as many mistakes, um, although mistakes are going to be inevitable in any business. Always uh, make uh, mistakes. Sure. You just got to learn from them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, great stuff. Britt, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I see we're, we're, out, of, uh, we're out of time. But amazing stuff. Um, guys, I hope you check out the website for the Giving Keys and see all that they're about. Um, and um, we've got some keys we'll be giving out today. Uh, we, have, we got some comments back on Facebook. Thanks for those. Um, Britt, terrific stuff. I uh, hope we see you soon. 
And uh, for everyone else, thanks for uh, thanks for checking out the show today. And we'll be back. Our next show is on uh, on January 25th. So until then, uh, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye, guys.